So welcome everybody here to the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke and I'm the director of the center. We bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater, and we hope uh, at least, and we believe we made a contribution that um, that bridge is thinkable in New York City. Uh, American artists, especially theater artists, are very skeptical, uh, as is the American population when it comes towards academia. It often, you know, it's used as something that's not so great and not so good. And we, of course, think this is an important part of the world to have the learning to explain what we where we come from, where we are, where we are going, and what meaning is about. And theater, I think, does a great job about this. Um, tonight, we have one uh, with us who's one of the great explainers of theater, uh, what it means, uh, wh what is it, why do we do it, why do we look at it, what have uh, people thought about it, what have people written over centuries, over millennia, and as you know, the uh, uh, great uh, scope of Marvin Carlson's uh, interest from Arab theater, European theater, the Ibsen, but also um, uh, the um, American theater is uh, uh, just a stunning. And um, tonight, I think we will witness something um, significant and important. It will be Marvin's first lecture. He's thinking about making a tour around the countries uh, he has visited, and because he's still with us, uh, but officially um, retired which is unbelievable, but it's actually true. Even so, a lot of his students retired before he did. And, um, but um, everybody who knows Marvin knows how sharp his mind is, how clear his thinking is, and how uh, valuable his eyes are. He does hold the world record of um, a living person going to theaters. He did a book which was called 10,000 Nights. It's really true. Um, we were in contact uh, with the uh, Ripley's. Is it, how is it called? No, the Ripley's, the other one there. Guinness Book of Records, and they said, well, we would do it, but he doesn't have all the tickets over the evening, And but they said it's unmatched and unparalleled, and so Marvin did a great book um, that he published, and then um, in the time, as you can see here, Memories of the Theater Before the Plague, which refers to Corona, um, he added uh, another um, 10 years. We were proud and honored to publish it. We have collaborated with Marvin over decades. He is one of the greatest, if not the greatest supporter of our center. So we would like to thank you, Marvin, um, for uh, doing that. Anybody who is also, of course, interested in you are his book, Short History of Theater, is also a sensational uh, uh, overview. It's like a, 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 a little um, satellite going around the world and beaming down, the taking off images is uh, fantastic. I think also contribution of what a global theater is about, and uh, this is also what is so close to our heart. So Marvin will uh, come up, he'll give a lecture on the 30 years of theater studies, which I think also is quite uh, a unique thing to listen to with someone who has been such a grandmaster in chess, we would say, of the game for 30, 60 years, the observations, and you'll be the first one to hear it with our HowlRound audience, which of course I would like to uh, welcome and uh, thank Vijay and uh, Pia and everybody involved. and. Uh, Fernando up there, um, but it will be quite an interesting evening. Then we will have a short uh, a conversation. Everybody will get a copy and upstairs on the third floor, I hope you can all join us. The theater department is about to host the reception, the joint presentation, what we have here in the initiative came from the theater department. Um, um, so we are honored, would be great to have you come up because I think there's a lot of food and a good drink. So I hope you can all make it. Um, if you have a cell phone, uh, please take it out. For a second, I'll do the same. It should be silent mode or off. And the, uh, the, pho not, the phones never ring at our events. So it would be the first ever tonight in 20 years. So um, Marvin, uh, come here. And I think first a big round of applause for life and work and the contribution he made. Thank you so much, and thank you, Frank, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to be speaking tonight about 60 years in the theater, but unlike the book that we're celebrating tonight, this is not about theater going, but about my professional life in the theater. Uh, in, the, in recent years, I have been thinking back over how different the study of theater as, a, as an art form, as an academic discipline, has changed 
over my lifetime. It's quite, it really is quite a remarkably different enterprise now than it was when, when I began at the end of the 60s or really at the end of the 50s. Um, and so tonight's uh, talk is really a reflection on that odyssey and those changes and at least my idea about the various forces that cause the changes for good or ill. Uh, I will be mentioning a number of names, some of whom are in the audience. Uh, you may find that your remembrances are very different than mine, which is fine. Uh, we can discuss this after, uh, uh, after the talk, and I'd, be, I'd love to hear different opinions about how things have gone. Uh, and of course, there is the much larger audience that's watching us on HowlAround. Uh, they also uh, may have differing opinions, and I'd love to hear what they have to say about these things. I'd also love to hear when they agree with me, but both are fine. So here we go then. When I graduated in 1959 with an MA in English from the University of Kansas, I had already decided that my future lay in the theater. I had taken every drama course offered by the program, been extremely active in the university theater, and written my MA thesis on the plays of Ibsen, then and still one of my favorite authors. The leading PhD programs in the Midwest at that time were at Iowa and Northwestern, both with faculty whose work I knew and admired but I was determined to move closer to New York City. In that area, Yale had the strongest reputation for theater studies, largely due to the preeminent position in the field then held by Alice Nogler. But Yale had no theater program. Nogler was a professor of English. I did not really want to continue in English and looked for major schools in the Northeast with independent theater programs. In 1959, there were still very few. Among the Ivy League schools, only Cornell, in a number of ways more like a large Midwestern university than an Ivy League one, had such a program, which had been founded less than two decades earlier. In fact, the official title of the Cornell department was Speech and Drama which was the most common title for university departments teaching theater across the United States in the mid 20th century. Although in a few cases, theater programs in the United States grew up within literature departments as they often did in Europe. In the United States, their origin as it was at Cornell was usually in programs of public speaking. Cornell had a department of elocution and oratory as early as 1898, which became a department of public speech in 1914 and in 1942, a department of speech and drama, which is what it was when I arrived. According to the university catalog, the program was devoted to, and I quote, oral communication as a human study, exploring the limitations and potentialities of speech, particularly in public, in public address and in the drama. You see, drama is really trailing off at the end. The faculty of 11 had six in speech and five in theater and offered just over 40 courses, approximately evenly divided. There were only four upper level academic courses in theater then, one each on theater history, American drama, history of theory, and modern theory. The influence of the American educational theorist John Dewey and his emphasis on applied knowledge was strongly felt, especially in large state universities. And like these, Cornell required a balance of practical and academic work in the, for its theater PhDs, and also an equally strong background in both speech and theater. Aristotle's work on rhetoric was considered as foundational in this study as his work on poetics. And the speeches of Cicero, Lincoln, and Churchill were as closely studied by us as the plays of Sophocles, 
Shakespeare and Ibsen. This structure was, as I have said, characteristic of the field at mid-century. Academically, theater studies still remained in the United States universities, much under the wing of speech and rhetoric. Just as a generation before, speech had been under the wing of English programs. The development of academic professional organizations in the US marks how the field was changing. In 1911, a group of professors of English formed the National Organization for Teachers of English as an independent academic field. Only three years later, in 1914, teachers of public speaking within that organization proposed creating a new professional organization of their own. This proposal was very controversial. 57 members voted for the new organization and 56 voted against it. The, the, so it did pass, of course. But the National Association of Academic Teachers of Public Speaking, as it was called, was thus established. It had its own professional journal, the Quarterly Journal of Speech, which was launched the next year in 1915. In 1923, it was reorganized as the National Association of Teachers of Speech. In 1936, the American Educational Theater Association was formed. Despite its title, it did not develop like the speech association inside the university, but in fact began in the professional theater as an outreach to theater educators. In fact, university scholars then and later remained a minority of its members, which included theater professionals, representatives of community theater, army and military theater, and children's theater. This organization created its own academic journal, the first in theater studies, in 1945. Before that date, and for some time after, however, the journal with the highest reputation for theater scholars remained the Quarterly Journal of Speech. An odd feature of American theater studies is that for most of its history, this ad academic field has been represented by two rival professional organizations, each with its own scholarly journal, annual convention, and parallel structure. In 1948, Britain created a society for theater research, and seven years later in 1955, this British organization called a meeting in London to create an international organization devoted to theater research. To call this organization international, was at this point more of a hope than a reality, since only one of the 21 delegates came from outside Europe. That was a representative from Japan. Even though the United States was not represented at this London meeting, a small group of European-oriented American theater scholars, led by Alva Snogler at Yale, inspired by the London meeting, established in 1956 an American Society for Theater Research, which from the beginning had close organizational and personal ties to its European counterpart. Over the years, the American Educational Theater Association and the rival American Society for Theater Research have sometimes worked very closely together, sometimes operated almost as rivals, and on occasion even considered merging. But their separation continues today, each with its loyal followers, although many scholars in the field are members of both. Why two professional organizations? The origins, of course, lie in the origins of the field itself, which has always been somewhat divided between institutions in the northeastern United States and those in the Middle West. This appeared again in more recent times in the rival origins and development of modern performance studies. In the universities of the Middle West, theater generally grew out of communications and speech programs with continuing strong ties to rhetoric and public speaking. In the East Coast, and especially in the Ivy League, the study of theater grew up within and in some cases never separated from 
departments of English. Cornell was unique in the Ivy League, not only in actually having an independent theater department like a Midwestern university, but also like the Midwest in developing it out of public speaking. In other respects also, Cornell followed the Midwestern pattern, not the Ivy League one. It combined, for example, academics and practice, while other Ivy League schools followed the European pattern of leaving the practical side of theater to separate conservatories or to student organization drama clubs. The two professional organizations actually reflected these two different orientations. The more pragmatic and practical American Educational Theater Association included such areas as community theater, army theater, children's theater, while the American Society for Theater Research restricted its concerns to traditional academic ones almost exclusively to theater history. Perhaps most fundamentally, at least during the first two decades of ASTR, the two organizations followed quite different models of, of membership. AETA, devoted to a diverse public, followed the now familiar structure of most academic societies in America. It was open to anyone wishing to join and willing to pay the dues. ASTR was rather more like a European professional gentlemen's club, consciously exclusive and limited, and accepting new members only if they were nominated by an already established member. The sponsorship requirement ended during the egalitarian 1970s, but ASTR remained a much smaller and more focused organization than ATHE. Often, I heard its members refer to themselves as the serious scholars in the profession. These different orientations were also reflected in the national conventions and in the professional journals of the two organizations since the Society for Theater Research launched its own journal, Theater Survey, in 1970. When I arrived at Cornell in 1959, I was quite unaware of the American Society for Theater Research, which had been founded only three years before. But I was strongly aware of the Educational Theater Association with which Cornell had a close association from the beginning. Indeed, my own thesis advisor, Darkus Albright, was one of the first national presidents of that organization. Within a few years, however, I became aware of ASTR and attracted by its focus on my own concern, theater history. Sponsored by Richard Moody, a Cornell graduate who was among the founders of ASTR, I joined that organization and from then onward remained, like many colleagues, a member of both professional organizations. The focus of ASTR on theater history was hardly surprising, since that was the aspect of theater studies that almost exclusively concerned academic theater students at that time. My first book was A History of the Theater During the French Revolution, and my research during the 1960s and 70s, when I was a member of the Cornell faculty, was entirely historical. Although I was involved, as was typical of the theater faculty at a large university, in both academic and production work, my teaching reflected my research interests. The program had no courses in dramatic literature, which was taught in the English and foreign language departments and elsewhere, and I did not teach the one course in theater theory, which was a survey of writings on that subject from Aristotle to Shaw, made up entirely of readings from the only source then available, a collection of fragments of rather uneven quality called European Theories of the Drama, assembled by Barrett Clark, a prolific author and editor of theater materials in the early years of the century. In 1967, the Cornell English and Theater Departments made a joint appointment of Bert O. States, the first serious theater theorist I had ever encountered, and began building a student interest in this, up to that point, largely neglected aspect of the, of the discipline. 
For my students and the profession, however, theory at this time remained a rather exotic side interest, rather like Japanese theater. Traditional Western theater history was still the focus of the field, especially after 1968, when Oscar Brockett's History of the Theater first appeared. From the outset, this book established a clear lead over competing volumes and appearing in new editions every few years, it remained for decades the one essential book for advanced theater students. Reading Brockett became the standard first step in preparing for PhD exams. And indeed, a knowledge of Brockett alongside a handful of canonical plays was often all that was needed to get past these examinations. The turbulence of the 1960s was strongly felt at Cornell, a center of the anti-war movement. And in 1969, when armed black students occupied the student union building, the rising black power movement as well. Although the upheavals of this decade greatly affected the theater world in general, that effect was only gradually felt in the organization and focus of the academic profession. The various structural changes in the professional organizations reflected the period's increasing interest in populist reforms, however. Early in the 1970s, ASTR gave up its requirement that new members had to be nominated by existing members, that anybody could join. While in 1971, AETA clarified its diverse constituency by renaming itself the American Theater Association and uniting under that title six largely independent sub-organization, one on children's theater, one on university and college theater, one on community theater, one on secondary school theater, and uh, one on uh, university resident theaters. It also stressed its broad mandate by dropping the term educational and becoming simply the American Theater Association. My own teaching and research and that of the profession as a whole showed little change, however, during the 60s and 70s, but major shifts were developing which would profoundly alter the field during the following decades. One was the growing interest in feminist studies, spurred by books like Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique in 1963. Two others uh, were led by, th two other major books uh, were produced by theater professors, uh, I'm sorry, two other books Two other aspects of change came from two theater professionals, both at New York University, Brooks McNamara and Richard Schechner. The former devoted to popular culture, the latter to the concept of performance. Of these, only popular culture made a distinct impact on the profession before the 1980s. In 1974, the New York University Journal, the, the Drama Review, at that time the major voice for new ideas in theater theory and practice, presented a special issue on popular entertainments, edited by McNamara, the first such scholarly collection. I contributed an essay to this issue, my first contribution to the Drama Review. Although many conservatives in the profession feared that the legitimization of popular culture would damage the scholarly standing of the field as a whole, the Educational Theater Journal presented a similar special issue the following year, and the American Society for Theater Research devoted its annual convention to the subject, considerably altering the accepted field of theater studies and helping to open the way toward the even broader idea of performance studies which followed. In 1979, Oscar Brockett left Indiana University for the University of Texas, and I was invited to replace him. It was a flattering offer, and after 20 years at Cornell, I felt it was time for me to change. I naturally assumed that I would be essentially the resident theater historian, as Brockett had been. But the Indiana chair, Keith Michael, urged me to begin teaching theory as well, 
which neither Brockett nor I had done. It was a major but intriguing challenge and I began planning for a regular survey course and seminar in theory. I first began looking for a general history of theater theory, similar to what Brockett had provided for the history of production, but was astonished to find that nothing of the sort existed. Again, this indicated the general indifference to theory in the field at that time, since Brockett's history text had at least six or seven quite respectable rivals. I therefore decided to begin writing such a book alongside developing my knowledge of the field. The result was the publication in 1984 of my theories of the theater, which sought to address that lack. How far the field still had to go was suggested by the fact that when I sent this book to the Cornell Press for consideration, one of the reviewers urged that I conclude it around 1950, since, he said, it was impossible to tell what was important in more recent writing, unquote. I responded that more recent theory was what the students wanted and needed to hear about and fortunately, Cornell accepted my argument, thus allowing me to include the theater of the absurd, Grotowski, the politically engaged theater of the 60s and 70s, the developing black and feminist theater theory, Schechner and Turner's anthropological exploration, and the beginning of semiotic theory, all of which had happened since the 1950s. Semiotics represented for me and, the, and for the profession a special case since it was the first manifestation of a shift toward theoretical concerns that would dominate the field going into the future. In 1979, when I moved to Indiana, I was already aware of this new approach through French writing, but English scholarship in the field was just beginning, opened by Kerry Lam's flawed but highly influential The Semiotics of Theater and Drama, which appeared in 1980, the first book in English in the field. I had already decided to offer my first theory seminar in Indiana in semiotics when I discovered to my great surprise and good fortune that Indiana was home to one of the world's leading sites for semiotic studies, the Research Center for Language and Semiotics, founded there in 1965 by one of the field's most distinguished scholars, Thomas Sibiak. Sibiak was one of the most brilliant and eclectic scholars I ever encountered, and theater was among the multitude of human and animal behaviors which fascinated him. I soon joined the large group of his friends and admirers and thus became involved with semiotic studies just as it was gaining in importance in theater studies. Thus, during the 1980s, much of my work was influenced by semiotics. Some of the most interesting early works in this field were done in architectural theory, and I was inspired to combine that approach with my historical background for my 1989 book, Places of Performance. Sibiak's own journal, Semiotica, now joined Theater Journal and Theater Survey among my favorite journals, and I began attending semiotic conferences alongside theater ones. In 1984, Sibiak urged me to attend my first international conference, which was in fact the first one held in the semiotics of performance, devoted primarily to opera and held in the conference center in Royal Mont, France. There, I met most of the scholars from around the world concerned with applying semiotics to theater studies, among them three emerging leaders in the field who became close friends and colleagues, Patrice Pradi from France, Freddie Rokum from Israel, and Erica fischer lichter from Germany. During the decade, all four of us found our interest in semiotics moving from the analysis of individual performances to concerns of how different semiotic systems interact. This came about partly as a growing internationalization of theater scholarship and partially in response to the highly publicized and influential intercultural experimentation of, of leading international directors like Peter Brook and Ariane Neustein. Indeed, I presented a paper on the intercultural work of these two directors 
at the first major seminar in intercultural theater held in 1988 by Fischer Lichte in Bad Homburg, Germany, where representatives came from Europe, North America, Asia, and Africa. Erica Fischer's own work increasingly moved in this direction and led to the establishment of her research institute called Interweaving Performance Cultures in Berlin in 2008, which became the most significant center for such research in the new century. Before leaving Indiana, I must mention that while there, I took advantage of Indiana's noted reputation for language training to undertake my first non-Western language enrolling in their program in Arabic. The Eurocentric character of traditional theater studies was beginning to trouble many younger theater scholars, and Arabic held a particular attraction for me, my first graduate student having been an Egyptian scholar, Abdul Aziz Hamouda, who later became rector of Cairo University, where I many times visited him. A major shift in my professional career occurred in 1986, when I left Indiana to accept a position here at the City University of New York. Obviously, my new location at the center of the American theater and with easier access to Europe had an enormous influence on my life and my career. But looking back now at the closing years of the 1980s, I realized that my own career changes took place against a background of major shifts in the field of theater studies, which in one way or another affected almost everyone in the field. At one important level, these years marked the passing of the generation of scholars that had established the field, its structures, and its procedures, with the coming of a new generation with very different ideas of theater study and of its place in the academic world and the world in general. The most obvious organizational change was the total disappearance of the American Theater Association, which had been the leading professional theater organization in America. It dissolved in 1986, cutting loose its constituent elements, such as children's theater, army theater, community theater, to function on their own. Details of that dissolution are now buried in the archives and in individual memories, but from an institutional point of view, it is important to remember the generally suppressed fact that the ATA was forced into bankruptcy by fiscal mismanagement. Why this is important is that no officer of that organization was legally allowed to assume an official position in any related subsequent organization. This in turn meant that when an inevitable replacement organization did appear, the Association for Theater and Higher Education, it had to be organized and operated by a new generation, all of the elder leaders of ATA being legally banned from participating. The year 1989 has often been called by historians of modern American theater studies a watershed year in the development of the field. Almost inevitably, they take as their central example the ASTR, that's the uh, historical or, or Eastern organization, the ASTR conference in Williamsburg, but in fact, all three major annual conventions that year made distinct contributions to the change. First came the June conference of the International Federation for Theater Research in Stockholm, organized by Wilmar Sauter, one of the leaders of the new generation of international theater scholars and the next president of this organization. Traditionally, IFTR conventions were organized like most academic conventions then and since into a pattern of keynote speakers and small panels. Souter instead divided the conference into eight areas, among them theater history, sociopolitical theater and performance theory in which scholars interested in these areas meant for seminar-like seminar discussions similar to the 1988 conference in Bad Homburg. Although this radical restructuring was not repeated, one group, Performance Theory, of which I was a member, decided to create an ongoing 
sub-organization within IFPR meeting during subsequent conventions. Th thus was born the first IFPR working group, a structure which became more and more central to the organization. Today, there are over 20 working groups within IFPR, and these have become essential elements in the, in the organization. That's the first of the three conferences. The closely affiliated American Society for Theater Research held that same year a conference in Williamsburg, Virginia, which widely considered another watershed event. I have mentioned that despite the tremendous effect of the political upheavals of the mid-1960s onward, in many aspects of theater production and performance, their direct effects on theater scholarship in the United States was still relatively minor. The theme of the 1989 Williamsburg Conference, quote, theater and politics, directly confronted this slack and opened a divide between American theater scholars that continued through the rest of the century. The, uh, uh, the choice of Williamsburg, where American and Confederate flags greeted the delegates as they entered the conference hall, encouraged a new consciousness of racial politics among this still almost totally white organization. Even more visible was a new consciousness of the rising importance of feminist concerns within the profession. Encouraged by a conference call from Gay Chima and the planning committee for papers that would examine power relationships in the theater and in society, many of the papers, although wide ranging in period and geography, challenged the racism and hegemonic patriarchy deeply embedded in previous theater scholarship. This critique extended beyond race and gender to question such fundamental ideological concerns as the positivistic approach to research or the sociological assumptions of traditional humanism. A confrontation, sometimes quite personal, between older generation and its methods and procedures and the younger one came uh, with a very different, a younger one with a very different organization had been brewing in the theater for some years. Probably the key document in this struggle was Bruce McConaughey's 1985 essay toward a post-positivist theater history, which directly challenged traditional theater research in the person of Oscar Brockett as imposing a narrow and hegemonic view of theater upon the profession. This challenge was bitterly resisted by some in the organization, especially the older members, and a struggle between, quote, history and, quote, theory troubled the profession for many years. In 1989, at this convention, I gave the State of the Profession speech, which concluded this turbulent meeting. And in this, I argued that given the intellectual revolution during the previous two decades, especially the critiques of assumptions about objectivity and the neutrality of language, historians really could no longer assume that a single traditional methodology was self-evidently superior. In a world where many different cultural perspectives were now being represented, there was no common audience with a common agreement on how or whose his history should be written. The historian at this juncture must begin with theoretical questions, including ethical and political ones, and must ask the purpose of history writing and to whom it was responsible. This speech, slightly reworked, appeared in a 1991 book, The Performance of Power, which included a number of Williamsburg papers and served as a kind of guide to the new directions the profession was now going. Its editors, Janelle Renault and Sue Ellen Case, were already among the cl clear leaders in these new directions. Renault in the area of theater as a political operation, and Case in the emerging area of feminist theater studies. Another major development of the late 1980s was the emergence of feminist studies as a major interest in the field. A fem and this is certainly a, a, in clear evidence of Williamsburg. A feminist interest in theater had been growing steadily throughout the 1980s 
but emerged into the mainstream in 1998, the year before the Williamsburg Conference, with the publication of two foundational works in the field, Jill Dolan's The Feminist Spectator as Critic and Sue Ellen Case's Feminist Theater. These books ensured a central place for feminist studies in the complex new vision of the field, which was now emerging. Although the performance of power grew, grew most directly from the Williamsburg Conference, it began by stressing the importance of various recent conferences in the rapid changes now occurring in the field. Indeed, some of the essays included came from a third 1989 conference of the recently formed ATHE in New York, which both Case and Rennelt attended. Both also participated in what was widely seen as a central event of the conference, a two-session panel entitled Theory Slash History, The New Convergence. The panel included a number of the leading emerging voices in the field. In addition to Case and Renault, there were Rosemary Banks, Ellen Diamond, Timothy Murray, Thomas Possaway, Joseph Roach, and myself. The panelists, although their, their approaches varied considerably, did agree upon a growing convergence of the sort outlined here and in my Williamsburg paper, but still meeting with growing resistance to all this new theory from more traditional members of the profession. The struggle between the two positions, in fact, troubled the profession for most of the rest of the century. Sharp divisions appeared in the next major conference in San Diego in 1990 over the relation of theater studies to such matters as race, gender, or class. The confrontational tone was represented when Sue Ellen Case prominently walked out of Jonathan Miller's opening keynote address when he dismissed feminist readings of The Taming of the Shrew as, quote, simply boring. In addition to the flashpoints of race and gender, there was an ongoing tension between proponents of more traditional, largely archival-based research and more abstract European-oriented work often utilizing a more specialized critical vocabulary, which traditional scholars often found offensive in itself. I still recall convention speeches in the 1990s being interrupted with shouts of, no more jargon. Traditionalists were particularly disturbed when during the 1990s, the editorship of the professional journal, theater journal, fell into the hands of the radicals especially Sue Ellen Case, who ended her editorship with a special issue entitled, quote, Theater Hege and Hegemony, flaunting the theoretical term that many traditionalists found particularly offensive and representative of the new critical vocabulary. So disturbed were some that the organization actually created a new journal in 1991, Theater Topics, which was privately justified as a journal that would avoid the linguistic and theoretical excesses of those now controlling the major journal, but which more publicly justified its, itself in gentler terms as a journal that would be, quote, accessible to both scholars and practitioners, unquote. The complexity of the situation was increased by the growing importance during these same years of performance theory especially as championed by Richard Schechner at New York University. As early as 1973, Schechner had been calling for his own desired convergence between theater studies and the social sciences. And although his journal, The Drama Review, was widely read in the 1970s and 1980s for new trends in theory and production, his championship of what he called performance studies did not have as great effect on the field of theater studies during the 1980s as did other approaches. This changed after 1992, however, when the program organizers for the annual convention of ATHE invited Schechner to give the keynote address in Atlanta. Most of those attending, if they knew Schechner's work at all, knew him as a reputable scholar, but somewhat on the fringes of the discipline, 
with interest in Southeast Asian ritual drama, quasi-theatrical forms like street theater, sports, and political conventions, and esoteric avant-garde artists like Jerzy Grotowski. Few expected Schechter to explode a rhetorical bomb by arguing that the theater represented by his audience, devoted to the staging of traditional Eurocentric drama, was headed for virtual extinction in the next 20 years, becoming a distinctly minor element in a much larger and more important field of performance. Like Sewell and Case, Schechter was well aware of the power of outrage to stimulate discussion. And after 1992, performance joined the other areas of contestation, which were causing deep divisions within the hitherto generally unified world of theater studies, especially in the United States. For a decade or two after Schickner's challenge, many felt that scholars in the field had to choose between theater and performance. But gradually, as with the earlier history theory divide, convergence triumphed over antagonism, and today programs of theater and performance are a significant part of the academic landscape, including the program here in this institution. Although I heard Schechter's notorious Atlanta speech, I did not share the shock and dismay of many of my colleagues. Nothing he said was at odds with his clearly expressed opinions of the last decade, and my only surprise was that those who invited him to speak were apparently unaware of either his opinions or his style. In the wake of the widespread controversy in the profession, generated in part by Schechner's challenge, Rutledge asked me if I would write an introduction to performance, building in part upon my work in theories of the theater. Although the primary aim of my 1996 performance, a critical introduction, was not at all some sort of reconciliation of performance in theater, it did attempt by considering performance as an event-based social activity to show how it both the work both paralleled and complemented the new attention within theater to such matters as identity formation, cultural placement, and postmodern indeterminacy. By no means unrelated to my own new interest in performance, but really much more developed from my early interest in semiotics, was a growing concern with reception, which during the 1980s was gaining increasing attention among European semioticians and other theorists. The early semiotic model, concerned primarily with how signs were created, was now widely seen as incomplete without a consideration of how these signs were interpreted. The last three essays in my 1990 collection, Theater Semiotics, were all analyses of audience reception. As one of the founding members of the Continuing Performance Analysis Working Group of IFTR, I found our annual meetings an excellent opportunity to further, further explore how audiences process theater. Each member of the group made important contributions to reception analysis during the 1990s. Erica Fischer-Lichter, Janelle Rennell, Freddie Rokum, Ellie Rosick, and Michael Quinn. But my own focus was on how the memory of previous theater experiences affected new ones, a process to which I gave the name ghosting. And my thoughts on this subject go into the book, The Haunted Stage in 2001. Among the less publicized but highly justified critiques Schechner leveled against traditional theater studies was that it had from the beginning been profoundly Eurocentric, both in its membership and in its uh, scholarship. One, uh, one result, um, One result was the writing of my memoirs of six decades of theater going 10,000 nights, which ended in 2010, but which I've since added another decade, extending the chronicle up to the COVID international shutdown of theater. That addendum is appearing this spring, as you know, which along with this present lecture provides an admittedly idiosyncratic, but I hope informative look back over a lifetime of theater going and professional participation. 
As a historian, finally, I can think of few periods where the theater has offered so varied and ex exciting a range of experience as it has in my lifetime. And I hope these necessarily fragmentary testimonials will suggest something of that trajectory. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, okay. Marvin. And first of all, thank you all also um, for coming. Um, we will have a, a, a conversation perhaps also about the book, but maybe we uh, go directly to questions. This is such an, um, such an incredible audience, uh, what we have here tonight. I also want to let, thank Jim Wilson again as the executive officer of the program who have made this evening possible. And um, everybody who is here uh, from the faculty and former students, friends, and artists. But so maybe we go right away to um, some remarks or um, thoughts on Marvin's talk. Hi, thank you so much, Marvin. It's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm Stacy Wolf, I teach at Princeton University and Marvin uh, was and still is one of my most treasured uh, mentors, um, just a cheerleader in every way and a brilliant, brilliant scholar and teacher. So thank you and thanks for this lecture, which was definitely crazy, my childhood. Um, but I guess my, my question is kind of going back to the beginning of your story and how with there barely even being a field that we understand as theater studies, how did you even have the idea that theater was something that one might study? And why did you want to do a PhD? And how, how, how did the beginnings come about? Well, uh, I certainly didn't start out thinking I was going to be a theater scholar. Um, or now we have a new term, a theatrologist, I find, is what I am now. Uh, the, I came into the theater the way many people, indeed I would be tempted to say most people do, and that is I love to act. Um, I mean, you, this is what all children do, and many of them never get over it. Uh, the, uh, uh, I, by and large, drifted into English because I was a, um, uh, I loved to read books and I was a sort of standard average bookish young man and therefore, and did not quite know what to do with my life. So I majored in English. That was a, that was sort of what people did then. Uh, maybe still do. Uh, uh, and then within English, uh, then I began participating in the, uh, even as an undergraduate in, in the, the local drama club, and that absorbed more and more of my time and attention. I finally realized, I, I think my, my thought uh, at, at when I sort of moved from English into theater was that, um, uh, was again, the production side of it. I, 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 was, I was aware of scholarship, but I really, I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in putting on plays and the process of putting on plays. And I thought uh, the problem with being an English major is you just talk about plays. It's so much more fun to do them. Uh, and it, was, it was as simple as that. And it really wasn't until I began thinking about what am I going to do after when I go on to graduate school that I began to think, well, what I really am not good enough to be a. I might might have be. I might might be a director, but I'm not an actor certainly, and I'm not even sure I'm a director or or a designer. I've done all this, but I'm. It's not that I don't love it, directing especially, but um, I find I guess finally kind of pragmatically I decided well, probably the best thing to do is to become an academic. Uh, it's not that I didn't dislike it. I always enjoyed writing. I enjoyed uh, uh, reading about theater. 
um, at, at, at that time to be an academic, as I said in the paper, really meant you were a historian. And as a historian, what you did was you collected a lot of facts and you put them in order. Uh, that, I mean, I, my first book on the theater of the French Revolution was because the uh, Cornell Library had a very, very large, one of the largest, I think the largest in the world outside of France, of French revolutionary plays. And this seemed, why not read every play I can get my hands on and, and summarize them, essentially. Uh, and that's sort of what the first book was. Uh, and I, again, I enjoyed it, but I, I, I don't think ever in my life before that I had thought, what I really want to do is dig into these archives and arrange all this material. So it, 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 it really sort of uh, evolved out of just the practical hands-on love of, of doing it. And then, of course, more and more the love of watching other people do it and how they, how they, how they did it. Hi, I'm Marla Carlson. I'm one of Marvin's former students um, who retired the same year he did. <laughs> um, and I was I was really interested um, to learn that you had studied Arabic while you were at Indiana. I didn't know that. I thought that it was another of your 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 skill with languages and the the large number of languages you have taught yourself um, over the course of your career is is well known and and uh, widely marveled at. And so I was wondering, since Arabic is something you had started learning um, earlier in your career and then picked up again um, more recently, um, I'm wondering if there are if there's some other thread that uh, that you could talk about that some some other piece of your scholarly life that had a life. Um, a start early in your career that you then picked up later and what, what that was and what that was like. Hmm. It's an interesting question. There's, I mean, there are so many different areas that, that have interested me over time. I, I guess the other thing that became m much more important in, in toward the latter part of my life was a kind of interest, a, 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 a kind of psychological question. I was always interested in how memory worked, how you remember things and what you remember and, and how, how, me how your memory was constructed. I remember doing some, some uh, very primitive papers in high school about, about uh, the we had we had some assignments of things like how I spent my summer, and I got interested in the question of how do you decide what parts of your summer are worth putting down? But I mean, it's it's a kind of a, a, a narratological question. But I, I but that certainly is something that then later on I thought you know I used to be very interested in, in how you remember things. Uh, that that's the first one that comes to mind. There may be others. Hi, um, I'm Dan Benning. I teach up at Union College. Another one of Marvin's advisees. My undergraduate advisor was one of Marvin's advisees, so it's generational. But Marvin will always be my advisor, um, even as I teach. But I asked a question at an ASTR panel celebrating the first 10,000 nights about what's next what would you imagine if you followed this up and you said i think it's uh i think it's immersive theater and i think it's sleep no more so i was really excited to see the first chapter of this and to look forward to that and now i want to ask the same question in preview of the next update 10 years from now uh what do you think are the emerging trends of the 2020s what might be the first chapter if you had a book upon our returning from the pandemic sorry uh, for well, spoilers. Well, first, first of all, I I swear there will not be another ten years single. Uh, though to be fair, I did say that after the last one. Uh, 
so who knows but but uh, what what I am not doing is I'm not taking along my notebook to the theater and saying this will be oh this is what I'm going to have in the next book I'm, but um, uh, it's it's interesting I'd, I'd forgotten that 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 exchange but I would still hold by that I think the uh, uh, that uh, my, the the immersive theater ha, has not disappeared, but it's faded, uh, clearly. Uh, but I think for the first five or six, seven years after um, 2000, that really did dominate, especially the off Broadway, and it and it certainly left its mark in the in the New York theater. So I I would still stand by that. Um, I don't know if I'd be as fortunate going ahead, but but there are uh, two or three things that I would say are are certainly true. The uh, uh, the one thing that that is consistently true and has been for a number of years is that um, theater become well, especially the, the the large theater, the commercial theater, becomes more and more expensive and more and more, less and less risk taking, and more and more flashy, meaningless display so that you can feel like your money was well spent. Um, that, uh, I fear that trend is with us and I see nothing to stop it. So that means the more interesting theater uh, is going to continue to be the smaller theaters in New York. There, everybody has big financial problems. I don't think the theater is going to die of starvation, or, or, and I think we've now proven that one, what the one positive thing from the theater point of view about COVID was that I think it demonstrated to us that we've got to have live theater. We're not it. It's not going to be. I mean, there was a time before COVID where people said, "Oh well, uh, live theater is on its way out," but I think we now. Very few people would make that argument now. Uh, that still is a very general thing. More specifically, I would say, in addition to rising expenses, uh, I'd say the um, technology will continue to become more elaborate, more complicated, AI and so on. Theater has always expanded to connect the more and more of these things together. I just saw a production in Switzerland that used elaborate um, mixtures of live action, live uh, video action, uh, video being created on stage, which the Europeans do a lot of, uh, along with a certain amount of AI and objects on stage turning from real rocks in, into hologram rocks. I it. This, it seems to me we're going to see more and more of this. Whether there's a good, bad, or bad thing, who knows, but I do think so. In a more traditional way, um, I think it is absolutely certain that the, um, the range of, um, uh, especially ethnic theater is going to broaden. I mean, already uh, one of the things that I was teaching a, a Zoom course to uh, Chinese students earlier this year, and I said, I just want to show you the 10, the last 10 Pulitzer Prize winners in drama. And, and they were, only one was white. Uh, only, only two were men. And then I said, now let's look, let's go back 50 years and show you the 10 Pulitzer Prize. Of course, they're all white men. They all look alike. Uh, that's wonderful. I mean, and, and the theater reflects that. I think we're going to, we're going to see a much, inevitably, a much more ethnically diverse theater developing, not just, not just in off-Broadway, but, but, but in the Broadway. And again, we see a certain amount of that going on. Uh, the, the demographics are changing, and that means a richer and more interesting theater, certainly. So that, that I would absolutely say, is positive. Um, 
that's probably enough for women. Why not? That, but those are some of the things I see. Hi, Marvin. I'm Cindy Sibilski. I'm a producer, including of the New York Arabic Festival, and also a arts and culture journalist, including the special edition of American Theater Magazine on Japanese Contemporary Theater, which we held a panel here and you attended. I was very grateful yes. for that. So my question or more um, request is, could you expand a bit more about how the seeds of your love affair with Arabic theater came about and how you approached going into that as an American? It's a complicated question, really. I'll try to make it fairly simple. Um, when I when I study Arabic at uh, uh, at in Indiana, I uh, I had already worked on a number of European languages, and I just felt it's time to get a little more global. Uh, and I agonized a good bit over whether I should go for Chinese or Arabic, and I still think. Maybe that wasn't the right choice, but but it was. I mean, I'm glad I did it. I'm studying Chinese now, a little late, but I'm working on it. Um, the there, it was simply a matter of here is an area that, uh, and indeed, one of the reasons I didn't go to chi into Chinese was that uh, there were a few American scholars that were working in Chinese theater. Nobody was working Arabic theater. I mean, people didn't. People didn't even know Arabic theater existed. Uh, and indeed, Oscar Brockett famously said the Arabs, the Arab world could not have theater because they don't believe in representation. Uh, so it was, it really was a, a dark world. Um, and then as I mentioned in the paper, my very first graduate student uh, uh, was, was Egyptian and I had visited him and indeed He'd taken me to the theater in Cairo a number of times. So I had a I had that that connection. I came back to it really uh, after 9-11, where it's where where it seemed clearly the the need for knowing more about the Arab world was really much more desperate than it had been 15 years before. And so then I got really more serious about it. We had, we had a, we had the first here in, in this one was uh, 2011. I think. Where did the, do you remember where that conference, where that this the, uh, the conference of the, that first Arabic theater conference was? Uh, it was. It was in the old building. Yeah. So we had, we had literally the first. Uh, conference on Arabic theater in the United States, and, and we had uh, we brought in a number of. If anybody is interested, we have the conference proceedings, so you can you can get copies of it. Uh, and then other things happened. I came. Uh, I, I, a German colleague put me on to the fact that a German scholar had just discovered the play, the 13th century plays of Ibn Daniel, which had been lost for several hundred years and uh, was translated into the German. And so this was a big thing. I, then I, I began working on, on Ibn Daniel, which then expanded the, the known history of the Arabic theater back into the Middle Ages. So uh, a number of things, once your antennae are up, things keep appearing. And of course, today now uh, we have uh, a whole group of Arab American theaters and the Arab Comedy Festival and so on. And uh, I've met many of these people and worked with some of them. And so there's a real, uh, I've had a couple of graduate students who have worked on, on uh, uh, contemporary uh, Arab feminist writing. Um, and already, there, it's not a huge world, but it's connected and they reinforce each other. So new stimulation comes in regularly from that. Shall we then? Can we for Nesco, maybe here we are a little bit over time, so we have a few questions. By the way, also Arab Sages, uh, initially from Marvin and us, um, is being published, uh, dedicated to actually what you see on stage. Um, so Marvin, um, as some finishing questions, 
why do you think theater is important in the time in in the lives we in? Can you the mic? You need we need the mic. Yeah, you need the mic. I mean, to me, theater the mic. Uh, the mic. Oh, I I would say, why do you think life is important? Uh, to me, to me, theater is life. Uh, the um, I mean, almost literally. I I don't know if I how I would exist if I didn't have theater. Um, and it certainly is it has been for me uh, the source of not only my greatest moments of pleasure in life, among them anyway. Uh, getting married was one, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, but also but but in, it's it's it goes beyond pleasure that. Uh, uh, to me, theater is close to religion, as as all great art is. It's it, it, you get an in you get a connection with the universe, and particularly with with the human part of the universe that I can't get other ways. I think other people can get it through music, for example. Uh, and, and but for me, theater is what does it. Uh, and I don't know what more, what more I can say about it. It is it it is it's not only central to my 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 physical life. It's central to my spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And and the function of theater in Europe and America, of course, is different. But how, what do you see really? What does it do? Well, uh, as the, the Frank knew, me, le, means this as a leading question because he knows I. I don't much. I don't have a great, great admiration for the American theater. I'm a great fan of the European theater. Uh, the the um, generally speaking, the, although the American theater has produced a lot of incredible stuff, it 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 has done it in spite of a kind of cultural indifference to theater. Uh, I mean, generally in the culture. Uh, even even music is much more respected as an art in America than theater is, uh, but it's it it um, uh, it's not it's not only that that so many uh, Americans are indifferent, including the American government, of course, uh, indifferent to theater, but when they do think about theater, they think of it primarily as entertainment, not as anything other than that, as what might bring you. Uh, the kind of spiritual experiences I'm thinking about, or even on a less exalted plane, real insights into politics and and um, uh, social dynamics and so on. Uh, I just got back from a week in, in, in Europe. Every play I saw was deeper intellectually, politically, spiritually. Every play I saw than anything I have seen in the New York theater in the last six months. I'd be tempted to say the last 10 years, probably be unfair. Uh, but uh, but the, the, there is a feeling, especially in Eastern Europe and, and to, in Scandinavia, uh, a feeling that theater is really, you're not really, culturally aware unless you're aware of theater. And theater has a responsibility in those countries and sees a responsibility and feels the responsibility of commenting about current events and 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 uh, and, and, and and concerns. Um, the uh, uh, one one of the productions I saw was a really serious meditation on artificial intelligence. When am I going to see that on Broadway? Un un really unthinkable. Um, so anyway, yeah, the, the, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a totally different situation over there. Yeah. I'm surprised, given the lack of cultural support, that the American theater is as good as it is. I mean, it's really quite remarkable. Yeah. Um, if we look at your work, one could say that these three pillars, um, the, the teaching, the writing about theory, but also going to the theater, um, which is, how do you balance it? What, what, what is more important to you? Or is it the same? Oh, they are, they are, it's all connected. I, 
as any of my students will say, uh, I can't get to a nightclub without talking about three or four or five or six plays that I've seen, sometimes dozens. Uh, I, and I, I wouldn't even know how to think about theater if I didn't sit down and do that. And the same thing again, pick up any book I have written and you will find every, if not on every page, on every second or third page, a specific reference from a particular production I've seen this. Uh, very often, uh, it, it is something I see in a theater that gets an essay or a book started in my head. That's tr I'm just trying to sort of figure out why, why does that work the way it does? So it, 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 it is absolutely connected together. Mm -hmm. I, if, I, if, I could, if I had to give up one of the three, or if I had to keep only one of the three, it would be going to the theater. Uh, I could, I could go, I, I could go to the theater and not write or teach, but I couldn't write or teach without going to the theater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Um, maybe to come to a conclusion of the ten thousand plus ten nights which you have in the book, uh, what do you remember? What are moments you remember? What are great productions you saw? What I know there are so many, but what comes to your mind where you say, this was something sublime. This was something I saw. Oddly enough, I've thought about that. Um, and there are a few, and inevitably, they are moments. There are moments when, uh, as Sarah Bernhardt said, the God descends, and you see it, and you think, this is it. Um, these are different for different people. Uh, I'll give you two or three of them, although there are, uh, I can think of quite a few. Uh, the moment in um, uh, uh, John Gielgud's production of Long Day's Journey Into Night, when he climbs on the table, starts to turn off the light, and looks out at the audience as it hits him in the face. That's one. Um, the... Um, The moment there's there's there are a couple of moments in in um, uh, Peter Brooks Marat Saad that that do that. I think probably the one would be where all the where all the nobles have had their heads chopped off and they form a you see just the the pile of heads on the stage. Um, the um, uh, there's a moment in uh, George O. Strayler's The Tempest where um, um, the whole stage where he's, he breaks his staff and the entire stage collapses. And then he leans over and picks up the parts of it, puts it all in all kinds of places. Um, Sometimes they're very, they're very, they're incredibly. Though that's a huge effect. Sometimes they're very small. I remember a uh, a production at the Abbey Theater of a of uh, Brendan Bale's *A Hostage*, where a, a character comes out and starts pulling a spoon spoon on his knee, and you see that on the big screen. They're all moments. I don't think. I, it's like Elliot's moment in the Rose Garden. There has to be a moment. Uh, uh, or Thornton Wilder says, the intersection of timeless with time. That's what theater is. And, and for, for, for me, that, that really sticks to me. It is a moment when you think, this is it. The chills go down your spine. You think, this is, this is what we present. Well, thank you, Marvin, and thank you for sharing those moments. I mean, I'm trying to take again from the 10,000 plays you saw in the previous book and this one. These are things he, that he put down, put into a form, and uh, also the way how you got to the theater, the, the whole context of it. I think it's quite remarkable and a great way um, of remembering, and it is all about a memory. So um, thank you for um, your, your insights and your thank overview you. of the history of first of all, the theater studies uh, in the United States and the world and also your work and uh, sharing it. So I would like to ask everybody to give another big applause to Marvin and thank you for coming here. <laughs>